Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well and welcome to today's upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click the like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go, and yes, folks, they do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? When people mention Dogman, immediately people think of the creature, and then they may think of locations. Bray Road, LBL. Two of the most famous areas for dogman experiences to come out of. Taylor, Mississippi uh, is probably one of my favorites though. And um, the LBL is full of stories and experiences lore, etc. There's a lot to it. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of made-up stuff as well, like the Vampire Hotel and um, what's the other one there? Hotel California or whatever. Those were actually homes. I did an upload a long time ago about those. But with the lore comes truth as well. So anyway, today's upload is going to be full of dogman experiences and information around the land between the lakes. Let's get into it. Today's first Tennessee subscriber submission. Hey man, I am a subscriber and I'm just going to tell you that you've helped me out a lot more than you could ever imagine. I honestly had no idea these things existed. I believed in Bigfoot, but not dogman until last year, the beginning of winter. My buddy has a piece of land that butts up to a 10,000 acre park. It's called East Farm or East Fork and it's in Jamestown, Tennessee. Here locally it's known as Glen Obi. Me and my best friend Seth have hunted this place so many times I could not even begin to tell you. It's one of those places that makes you feel like someone is watching you all the time. It's a very unsettling place. Back before the 1900s there was a a lot of witches and black magic type junk. The road going down to this place is a steep decline down a mountain and about three quarters of the way down it takes a left and you cross a really narrow bridge that leads you to a gravel road that goes back into the woods at least five miles. Back in the early 70s a guy hung himself on that bridge. Back before dog man or werewolf happened just that alone gave me the uneasy feeling. Eventually, I got over it. Me and my buddy got comfortable enough with the place that we'd walk around at night with nothing but a headlamp on the dimmest setting because we didn't want to scare the animals. We were always both armed when we got there. I'd usually take my AR-15 and my friend had an AR-10 with a night vision scope. We really started carrying these guns after that winter evening. It was probably 3.30, maybe 4.00. I was in my buddy's truck with the window up and my buddy was standing pretty much right there in the driver's side door. I mean he had one leg out of the vehicle and one in. We had a tag along this day. His name was Dylan. He drove his own vehicle down because he wanted to bring his four-wheeler. We were setting by a cabin which is on my friend's property built in the early 1900s. 
you can really tell how old it is when you walk in and the doorway is only about six foot tall. I don't know how many times I've hit my dang head on that thing. Anyway, myself and Seth are just sitting there watching Dylan trying to start his four-wheeler. He probably cranked it three or four times and it just wasn't having it. I guess where it was a cold winter evening, it was probably 35 degrees. The time it finally started up right before it died, I kid you not that if I had to guess, it was a half a mile away and sounded like it was right beside us. It sounded just like a werewolf would sound, like in a movie. Like that long kind of sound, like a man was in there as well. It only howled once, and I would say it lasted 10, maybe 15 seconds. Seth and I just looked at each other in disbelief and couldn't really speak. Dylan didn't notice it because he was on his four-wheeler and it had finally started up. We never saw anything, but... I laid my hand on the Bible and I tell you, it sounded just like a werewolf in a movie. Typing this message is literally making my stomach turn. I don't tell many people because most wouldn't believe me anyway. And that's all right because I've offered to take anybody that hasn't believed me and yet not one of them has come with me. I also heard this about three months later, first thing in the morning like daylight. I do a lot of deer hunting and hog hunting, and the dog man, werewolf, whatever it was, when it howled at daylight kind of made me think that it was its way of showing us this was his territory. This time, it was quite a bit further away. It'd say anywhere from a mile to a mile and a half. I mean, it was the same exact sound. Before all this happened, me and Seth would go down there and throw out a lot of corn hunt three or four days out of the week. On the weekend, we'd normally hunt Saturday night for pigs if we were going to hunt at all. We have drastically slowed down and hardly ever go to that place anymore. Actually, about two or three months ago, cops found a dead body back there by the river. That should help you know just how desolate this area is. There is no service, not even any power line, so if anything happens, a man would be pretty much screwed. Also in this area, just a couple of miles away, a man got a picture of a black panther on his game camera. I just wanted to share my experience with you, man, because you've helped me a lot. Thank you, Jeff, and I hope all is well, brother. Today's second Tennessee subscriber submission. First and foremost, I have to say that I do not care if you believe this or not. This is not a campfire tale, but... A true story based on two encounters I had during my lifetime with a creature known as Dogman. I will not disclose the location, but I will say I've lived in Middle Tennessee since I was born in 1986. I've heard thousands of different stories and lores about this land that we have lived on and the surrounding areas. Ever since I can remember, I've been roaming and exploring the woods that surround our property since I was eight years old. And I've only had two encounters with this creature. Once when I was 14, and this year, 2020, at 34. During my first encounter, I was walking with a friend. We'll refer to him as Ronnie. Ronnie was three years older than me at the time. I was 14, he was 17. We knew the woods surrounding the property like the back of our hands. We had been squirrel hunting for many years back there, along with just roaming and exploring. Ronnie had been telling me stories about a demon deer. I figured that he was just attempting to scare me while we were deep in the woods. Coincidentally enough, when the wind stopped blowing, we noticed there was no noise, no insects chirping, no birds tweeting, squirrels barking, just dead eerie silence. In all my experiences in the woods, this gave me a sense that we were close to a big predator. Honestly, the biggest game that could possibly be in this area is a big-ass white-tailed buck. I mean, maybe a black bear, but those are way more common in eastern Tennessee. There was an instant where Ronnie and I would hear like a woman screaming or being murdered, which we later wrote off as maybe a bobcat or something. We both started looking around to get a sense of the surrounding environment. After a few minutes of no wind and noise... 
the tops of the trees west of our location started to sway. As we listened, we could hear this whoosh, whoosh, every time this thing jumped from one tree to another. The trees were swinging, groaning, popping underneath the momentum of this thing's weight as it launched itself from one to another. To be honest, I have no clue what the intentions of this thing were. I'm not sure it was trying to intimidate us, get our intention, or maybe just get a closer look, but Ronnie and I were not waiting around for this thing to jump to tree above our heads. So we sprinted out of the thicker brush, stumbling onto the old logging road. We could hear this thing following us by the sounds of the trees again snapping and popping as this thing was now swinging on the trees that were literally 20 feet away. We were so terrified because there should have been nothing in those woods with the ability to swing and launch itself from tree to tree moving like that. At the time, I hadn't even gotten a glimpse of whatever it was swinging atop the trees. It sounded like a 600-pound wood-roaming gorilla. We didn't stop and look, we just ran. We bolted down the old logging road all the way back to the road and down Ronnie's dad's driveway and into his house. We never spoke a word of it to anyone. Hell, we didn't even see it. What would we say? Fast forward 20 years, I'm now 34 instead of 14. Up until this second encounter, I have not known what it was that scared the holy crap out of Ronnie and I that day in the woods 20 years ago. Current date is August 14th, 2020. So I'm chilling out in the backyard smoking some killer nugget and burning this god-forbidden pecan wood that barely burns unless you have a very hot fire already going. The fire pit sits about 15 feet from the edge of the tree line. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh man, you were smoking pot. You probably hallucinated this. I have never hallucinated while smoking marijuana. And I'm a psychedelic advocate. I've dropped LSD numerous times, along with smoking 5-MeO-DMT and NNDMT, and never, while even on psychedelics, have I ever seen anything even close to this. As I'm relaxing by this fire out back, I hear a loud pop. I instantly snap my head up to look in the direction that the branch breaking noise came from. And that was the instant I first laid eyes on this thing. Blinking two or three times to actually make sure I was actually seeing this thing. Standing at the tree line 15 feet from my fire was a gigantic black outline of what looked to be a wolf standing on its hind legs. I was shocked at the sighting but noticed very fast that I did not feel afraid. I didn't feel negative energy coming from off of it. What I can only describe as literally an eight-foot walking wolf. I didn't feel the sense of evil everyone talks about. I actually felt relaxed and at peace with him being so close to me. As I looked closer, I noticed that its hair was well-maintained, didn't smell any obnoxious odors or smells of decay and death as many others have described. This thing looked civilized, tamed, intelligent, advanced health. I'd even say this thing looked enlightened with a knowledge I was totally unaware of. Its eyes were not amber as other accounts describe. This creature's eyes were a fluorescent blue. Mesmerizing, to be quite honest. As I'm looking, I noticed it had three braids in its hair on the side of its head. It reminded me of a Native American style braid because of the turquoise thread that was laced in between the hair and the braid itself. It looked like this thing is very well taken care of. That's why I say it looked advanced or maybe even just in tune with its environment. After a moment staring at it, it took off faster than anything I had ever seen before and almost unnatural on two legs, but at the same time so fluid and effortlessly. I feel like this was the creature that Ronnie and I had encountered that day in the woods 20 years ago. I think it was just curious of us. It didn't get off, it didn't give off any vibes of harm or danger, just curiosity, maybe bewilderment. I have looked at the woods and the world, for that matter, very differently since that August. Today's third Tennessee subscriber submission. 
Hey Jeff, long time subscriber, but never sent my encounter in. Not out of fear of what people think, I just can be lazy at times. But my encounter happened when I was younger, around 16, 2006. I grew up in East Tennessee, around an hour of east of Knoxville. I grew up target shooting and hunting in the woods behind my grandparents' place. Where we lived was in the foothill of the Appalachian Mountains. The place I haunted was a good friend of the family's farmland. The land bunded up to my grandparents' land, so needless to say, I was always over there. The layout of the land was a series of hills and valleys. One side of every hill was a clear of the long trees, along with a valley on the other side of hills was mixed with hardwoods and cedar trees. So, my encounter was one day, late winter, I decided to go squirrel hunting, just getting out with my dog. My dog was just a black and tan hound mix, with who knows what, as I picked her up as a stray. This day was very different than the rest, since normally she would just run all over the place, and if I needed to call her, I would just shoot my twenty-two up in the air and she'd come running. This time, she wouldn't get more than three feet away from me before stopping and making sure I was still there. The day was the typical cliché, no sounds of nature. I shrugged it off and kept going, even though I knew it was a sign of a predator in the area. I walked up one hill parallel, the tree line, about five to eight feet off. I heard something match pace with me, step for step. I stopped it, stopped. The entire time, my dog was at my feet watching where the sound was coming from. I have grown up in the outdoors, and I know the difference between something walking on four legs and walking on two. This thing was walking on two. But it was in the cedar thicket, so I couldn't see anything past the tree line. I continued up the hill, listening to this thing more or less stalk me until I got past the cedar thicket when it stopped. I walked further up and then down into the woods to see if I could get a look over and see anything. But as it never left that cedar thicket, I couldn't. I should mention that my dog refused to come into the trees with me. I walked back out of the trees and took the same path down the hill, still five to eight feet from the tree line. As soon as I got to the edge of the cedar thicket, the footsteps started again, step for step. This entire time, I never felt afraid or dread like many people mention. I was more curious than anything. I wanted to know what this thing was stalking me as I reached the edge of the thicket. There was about 10 yards of open ground, then a five-strand barbed wire fence that separated our land to their land. As I reached the end of the tree line, the creature let out a deep guttural growl that I felt. I instinctively turned to face where it had come from and backed up until I was against the fence. The creature never came out of the wood line and into the view, so I never actually saw it, but I know what bears sound like, as well as wild dog and coyotes, and this was neither of them. That deep sound and the length of time that growl happened, its lungs had to be huge to hold a growl that long. As I hit the fence, the only thing I could think was all I have is a single shot bolt action 22 and 10 yards to place it. I might as well have had a club. I stood waiting for the worst thing to happen to my dog and myself. My dog was standing her ground right next to me. She must have picked up on my body language and she knew I wasn't going to run. I was going to make a stand after what seemed like an eternity, probably close to three minutes. I heard the creature walk away. I was wasting no time to hop the fence and return home. I told no one about this. Since I knew they would forbid me from going back hunting there ever again. The next day I did go back, but this time with a short-barreled Remington 1100 12 gauge loaded with buckshot and slugs. When I reached the spot I had walked, I found a kill site of what had to have been more than one rabbit. I knew it was rabbit from the fur and bone I found there weren't there that day when I was there. Today's fourth subscriber submission. I'm a wife of someone who had an experience with something at one of the worst possible times in his life. It was April of 1994. 
we had just come out of a terrible winter. We had the worst ice storm earlier that year that caused such damage and power outages in our area. Needless to say, by the time April had got here, my husband went fishing with a buddy in a small creek that leads to a small river. Always good fishing there. My husband's dad was a commercial fisherman, and this was one of his favorite spots to drop his nets. Anyway, the guys fished until mid-afternoon, and after running the battery down on the trolling motor, they headed back to the truck. Well, when they arrived, who would be there waiting on them but my husband's dad? His dad had been waiting to go fishing ever since the weather warmed up, but during the ice storm he had fallen and broken his hip while tending to the cows. He had told my husband on several occasions, let's go fish, but for whatever reason my husband couldn't go. Well, my husband knew what his dad was wanting when they pulled up. He wanted to fish. He told them that the battery was dead, it didn't matter. He wanted to take our old boat down the creek and he said it'd be okay. No matter what my husband said, trying to talk him out of going, his dad was going. So my husband let him take the boat. You don't refuse a man like his dad. So my husband and his friend left and came back home. Fast forward to 9.30 p.m. We got a call from my husband's mom. Dad hadn't come home yet. He jumps up and heads back to where he left his dad beside the creek. He called his buddy that had been fishing with him earlier that day. And they both went to get dad. When they got to the creek, the boat was not there. Everything was, as when they left, they started walking down the edge of the creek yelling for their dad. They went a mile to the mouth of the creek where it dumps into the river. It was pitch black and the flashlights only reached a short distance when they heard a buzzing sound like an insect, but not like any insect they had ever heard before. They stopped and yelled for paw again. Then they saw on the other side of the river two sets of very large red almond-shaped eyes. At first, my husband thought they were deer. Standing and watching, when they flashed their lights toward the creek, they saw the boat on the far side of the creek. This might be confusing, but the creek meets the small river like a T. The eyes were on the right top of the T, and the boat was on the left bottom side of the T. The creek was too deep to wade across, and my husband didn't swim well, so they ran back up to the road by the truck and crossed the bridge and ran back down to where the boat was. When they got there, the eyes were still on the other side of the river. There floating by the boat was his dad. They jumped into the boat and pulled him in, but he had already passed away. They tried CPR, but he was long gone. They grabbed the paddle in the garden hoe that was in the boat and tried to paddle back to the truck. At first they hadn't realized that the boat was not tied off, it was just sitting there. They started trying to paddle, but they kept hitting something underneath the water. But that can't be, it's 15 to 20 feet deep where they were. But what were they hitting? Something, and it was jerking at the paddle and the hoe like it was trying to jerk it out of their hands. They were so freaked out, they had just found his dad dead. Big red eyes jerking the paddle. It's a demon and it's trying to get us, that's what my husband's friend said. My husband screamed, come on you son of a bitch. You got him but you're not getting us. My husband's friend was scared and tried to shut my husband up. But he told his friend, don't be afraid, then it stopped. They were able to get the boat moving. They were not hitting anything under the water. The paddle and the hoe were not being jerked anymore. On the way back, one of my husband's cousins had shown up on a four-wheeler, so they sent him to call rescue. When they finally got back to the truck at the bridge, rescue had just arrived. After ten years later, we had a Bigfoot researcher go with us to that spot where this happened. I had seen something on one of those Bigfoot hunting shows that made me think about the eyes they saw that night. This was the first time my husband had been back since the terrible night. He realized then that boat had not been tied off in the creek and river had significant current that the boat and his dad should have floated down the river but did not and where the eyes were it couldn't have been a deer 
the eyes were much too large and too high off the ground. So what actually happened that night, we will never know. But my husband said, if it hadn't been for the buzzing sound, they would not have found the boat as soon as they did. So did the creature with the red eyes cause my father-in-law's death? We don't know. Could they have been watching over him until he was found? We don't know. We do know that Pa spent a lot of time in the woods there and on the creek and river. So they could have known him. He could have known them. Oh, by the way, he's Native American. He was not scared of anything but respected all. I know this was a very personal story, but it changed my husband forever. He won't fish or hunt anymore. He does not want to be in the woods. I wish I could get my husband back. Thank you for letting me tell his story, our story. Same subscriber, next email. I should have given you more location info on my letter about my husband's encounter. This happened in West Tennessee in a small farming community called Crockett County on a small creek called Cypress Creek that dumps into a small river called Forked Deer River between Highway 54 and Highway 152. We used to live one mile from the creek on 152 and we had lots of scary things like hearing breathing next to the house and just creepy feeling that you did not want to be outside after dark. At the time I didn't know what was going on but when X-Files the series on there was a episode called The Detour and a creature in this show had red eyes and when my husband saw that he screamed at me that's what I saw. Needless to say, that was the last time you watched X-Files. That got me to researching, then finding Bigfoot started, so I eventually called them, started asking questions about the eyes. That was who the investigator was from, finding Bigfoot. <laughs> now I've talked to this subscriber, and I love this person. We had a good, decent talk a long time ago. Um, I'm going to actually email them to see if how the husband's doing to see maybe he'd be willing to come on i know he wasn't back then but maybe he is now needless to say finding bigfoot is a shit show um no offense to this person then they know i'm not trying to offend them at all they did the, they did a lot of filming up here and they they didn't find anything actually i remember two of the cast members up here were at like a diner uh called the hen house and um <laughs> the uh, owner he's just a he's a character you know he's owned the place for god 40 50 years and he, he messed with him and he i guess he had told him that he had seen something and because they were like city folk he had said city folk and he had him walk like a couple miles through some fields and wood line it was pretty pretty mean but anyway let's finish this email sorry I just realized I didn't tell you that the medical examiner ruled out foul play in my father-in-law's death, accidental drowning. There was no outward trauma to his body. I always thought that after healing from broken hip, when he had fallen into the water, he could have had a blood clot causing a heart attack. Also, my husband never told anyone except me about what really happened for fear of ridicule. He was a businessman in a neighboring, neighboring small town and we knew how the rednecks can be. So his friends, himself and me, were the only ones that knew what happened that night. He did give me permission to tell the story to Finding Bigfoot and BFRO, and they sent a lady investigator from Nashville. She was kind of nice, very understanding about the case. Her findings, as well as my story, is the one on Crockett County, Tennessee. She contacted me some time later and wanted to put this on her show, but my husband said no for fear of small town syndrome. I myself don't think that it was a Bigfoot. Um, and I know because the title of my channel, I'm going to say it was a dog man, but obviously I'm not just a dog man channel. Um, and I'll explain to you why I have that name sometime later. I've had the name for four and a half years now. Well, four years. Yeah, since 2017. But anyway, so the reason why I feel it is a dog man is because the glowing red eyes, the fiery ambered color eyes, you know, uh, we do hear Bigfoot having different colored eyes as well, but I just feel like maybe 
grandpa had been fishing there for so long that maybe when he was out fishing, he'd throw a, a dog man, a couple fish here and there. You know, you see it often, throw him a couple fish over, you know. I mean, in my eyes, it'd be more apt to throw a four-legged canine, even if it's big, some fish, because, you know, we care about dogs as humans, than a Sasquatch. Um, and maybe, maybe he just had, you know, a small heart attack or something, or maybe the dog man stood up and that really kind of put him over the edge. And unfortunately he was found, passed away in the river. So, I don't know. Anyway. Hmm. Today's final Tennessee subscriber um, submission is from a, a, someone who's been on the channel two or three times, Rusty Coleman or Donald Coleman Jr. Um, good friend of the channel, like I said, with other, he's been on other channels, but he chooses to share on mine because I try to be as nice as possible to all my subscribers. Um, Real great guy. He's been on the show, like I said, a couple times. Really interesting. He's got a lot of information. He actually is the guy that put me in touch with Kumbo. So I, I got a lot to thank this guy for. So let's get into Donald Coleman Jr.'s Tennessee subscriber submission. This he sent me via Facebook Messenger. Um, I don't use it, Facebook Messenger often. I should probably check it every once in a while, but um, I found it and here it is. I didn't hear about the LBL murders until I first shared my encounters with Lon Strickler on phantomandmonsters.com on February 5th, 2015 in written form using my own words. This is also a true story in 1982-83, year I was a public safety officer with South Fulton Police Department in Tennessee. The local liquor taverns were exactly like front half in Kentucky and the other half in Tennessee, the rear section. And when local law enforcement did nightly checks, Fulton City and South Fulton did the checks together. Our state line authorities backed each other up through thick and thin. Now, one weekend night in December 1982, our dispatcher went home at 1 in the morning, so I took her place from 1 a.m. until 3 a.m. Usually, I spent that two hours looking through the city code books of law, see what exist, existing laws were still enforceable and haven't been repealed. Phone rings at 1.30 in the morning, a woman cries out to me, that her home was under siege by criminals, two criminals holding her and her daughter and her boyfriend hostage against their will. She barely escaped capture and was hiding under her bed when she called my local department. So I asked her her 1020 location. She advised me on the northeast corner of Abian County, Tennessee, next to Weekly County, Tennessee, and next to Kentucky State Line. I asked her why she hadn't made contact with either the sheriff's department, only with mine. I got my sixth sense telling me this was a bogus call. So I told the woman to hold on. I was able to raise on low band law enforcement radio, Memphis, Tennessee Highway, and had the 1033 emergency traffic and needed immediate attention, requested high ranking officials with Tennessee Highway Patrol to contact me, Public Service ASAP, and a captain called me over the telephone. I relayed the 1033 emergency traffic concerning hostage situation, and he then asked me this bizarre question, how far is the LBL from this event, which at the time struck me rather odd, like why bring up the LBL in the first place, which at the time never heard about the LBL murders of the family of four, that happened in March of 1982. Anyway, Captain told me to treat this hostage call as the real deal and multiple agencies responded 
1033, linked to Kentucky Sheriff's Department, Kentucky State Police, Obin, Obion, and Weekly County Sheriff's Department, Martin Police Department, and Rescue Squad Ambulance Service. And I was later proved my sixth sense was proven accurate as a woman takes an original Home Alone episode before the creation of 911. That stunt cost her 11 to, nine, to 29 days in the county incarceration. You have my permission to relay this story on your Dogman channel. Okay, and then... This is, I have his, one of his encounters that he shared, but I'm just going to share the paper version first, and then I'll go off the top of my head quick. My pet peeve belongs to game wards in Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Kentucky. No matter whose boat I am in, whether as a passenger or driver, our boat will get pulled over every time. It's like I'm jinxed, curse like in the movie Uncle Buck. He always referred to his beaver hat as people getting angry seeing me wear this hat in case it was my flaming red hair and freckles that brought out the anger toward me from St. Game Wardens without fail every single time. And I'm scheduled to be driving my cousin's deck boat on the Lake Pickwick, August 22nd, 2020. We shall see if the jinx can be broken this time. I go with Cousin Scott Edwards, who has a lakeside cabin on Lake Pickawick in Burton Branch in southern Hardin County, Tennessee. We would do multiple state long distance river journeys all over Middle America, daily mileage in the restored 68 19 foot winter fiberglass tri haul. He has it for like a pop up camper two side curtains and a mosquito netting and boat seats fold down to make single beds. We also have a propane burner to cook meals on. Anyway, we lock through Pickwick Dam, heading first towards New Johnsonville, Tennessee, 105 miles ahead to spend the night at Cousin Laura Wood's residence and Doc Scott's boat at Pebble Island Marina. After AM breakfast, we got underway heading toward Lake Barclay state resort park and land between the lakes that was 200 miles up river we arrived at 4 30 p.m and a kentucky game warden checked out boat registration and our safety equipment and asked where is your fishing gear or hunting guns i replied sir we are only sightseeing and taking wildlife photos and enjoying mid-america's river system so he rechecked our boat again looking for illegal contraband and found nothing and now I am really pissed off at his bully lawman static. And we filled up the gas tank and five other plastic 20 gallon handheld cans. Went to the lodge to check in, went to our room, took a nap, got dressed to go eat at the restaurant, which has great food. Guess who I saw there eating? Game wardens, park ranger, and state police troopers sitting around two big tables after eating steak dinner. I changed tables and sat next to the lawman's table. As I sat quietly, I heard them talk about code names for cryptids like Sasquatch Black Bear and Dogman Black Dog and Werewolf Black Cow. This code name is used all over the United States when lawmen are summoned to an animal disturbance call. This also includes sheriff deputies, police, and public safety officers or constables or marshals. The time, 8.45 p.m. February 2011. Same subscriber, first email, because like I said, that one was on Messenger. Along the Hardin and Wayne County, Tennessee lines from Olive Hill, U.S. Highway 64, along rural roads between Lutz and Tennessee Highway 69 South along Second Creek, and Hog Wallow Road and Waterloo, Alabama, and along Waterloo and Florence Highway, two men in a dually pickup truck with mounted side large beam spotlights and a PA system. These men were earlier warned not to be traveling these rural back roads at night due to large packs of coyote, wolf, panther prowling alongside the rural road. 
as reports from the public riding in vehicles were being attacked by these creatures and reports of livestock farms missing cattle, chicken coming up missing, deer population being suddenly thinned out. Apparently, these two men thought the warnings from local people is hysteria, trumped up BS, found out the hard way, and hooping and hollering all over outside the PA system most likely stirred up the warranted attack on the big dually pickup truck in odd places along these various roadways, especially near high heel creeks and open fields in sparsely populated areas. Their truck was suddenly attacked by a large German shepherd slash wolf creatures who ran along both sides of the doors, slamming themselves against the doors and spotlights turned into high beams, illuminating these creatures, dark hair on the top, thick mange, mane behind their heads and rust colored hair, vicious large canine teeth, amber eye shine, estimated by the two men somewhere between 175 to 225 pounds on all fours, kept up with the pick, pickup truck of speeds of 45 to 55 and the assault episodes were in three different locations along these routes, which also ran along southern portion of Lake Pickwick and Lauderdale County, Alabama toward next community. Even packs of coyotes were chasing after these two men. Yes, you can say they are believers now. As we all know, the creature of the LBL is typically said to look rather like a bipedal wolf, standing around seven feet tall, sporting clawed hands, powerful jaws, wicked teeth, and glowing red eyes, cloaked in a horribly rotten stench. The area and its surrounding region has long held dark legends and secrets from before the time of the early settlers that trickled into the western part of Kentucky. Some of the first Europeans in the region were French trappers and hunters who claimed the forest was prowled by a massive beast, half man, half wolf, which would howl in the night and leave mutilated carcasses of animals in its wake, a monstrous entity called the Loup Garou. When settlers began to come to the region, they said they were being plagued by a large predator which lurked in the shadows, killing and maiming their livestock. Witnesses saying the culprit was a hairy, wolf-like beast on two legs which unleashed blood-curdling howls and shrieks into the night. The sightings of the monster were still frequent throughout the beginning of the 20th century. There have seemingly been quite a lot of alleged encounters with this creature of the land between the lakes, even up into modern times. There are several more stories about this dog-like beast over in LBL. There were groups of Boy Scouts that had seen it, several more campers, fishermen, and boaters that have seen it from the safety of their boats, floating in some of the many bays that touched upon the shoreline. Hikers and bikers have heard the towling and seen something stalking them while on the rural trails, hiding amongst the trees and foliage. Hunters have run across deer carcasses that were brutally torn apart. In the meantime, others have come forward with their own experiences with the first instinct is to run from this fierce elusive beast, hearing howls or coming across badly mutilated carcasses. All of them agree this was no Sasquatch. The most recent sighting was Labor Day of 2017 in the area of Lake Barclay. In August of 2010, another sighting was very descriptive. This following is an excerpt from investigators' report of the incident. Location details. Cads, Kentucky, follow 68 west heading towards land between the lakes. Turn right onto 1489 to Lake Barclay Resort and Marina. The incident took place about two miles up the Kentucky 1489 road and the Kentucky 68. The environment, the area of the siding, took place in a heavily wooded area along the edge of the main road, connecting Kentucky 68 to Lake Barclay Resort and Marina. The witness described the creature to be approximately seven and a half feet tall, three feet wide, stocky, with matted, medium brown hair. 
She first saw a deer break brush and run alongside her vehicle, quickly dashing in front of her van and across the road. She originally mistook the creature for a tree or bush, but realized the creature was chasing behind the deer. She said as it passed right outside of the driver's side window, it seemed to have a surprised look in its eyes. The creature was so close to the vehicle, she could have reached out the window and touched it. The creature did not cross in front of her after the deer, and the encounter only lasted a few seconds. She could no longer see it as soon as it was out of her headlights. Her husband was in the vehicle, but only her son was the one to see it as well. The witness was very forthcoming and genuine, describing the sighting her and her son had that evening. Still, other reports from the 70s and 80s claim the creature stalked and brutally killed a family of four. Another says a bow hunter was killed and torn apart by the same creature. Sometimes physical evidence is claimed, such as odd footprints, tufts of hair, and dugout nests that appear to have been slept in by something large. But these have all remained inconclusive at best. Almost all of the incidents concerning this dog man came from the areas north of Highway 68 and 80. Other Bigfoot sightings have come from various areas nearby, but not in the area of this dog man. Strange, a person who actually saw the beast gives a first-hand account of her experience. She described the odor of the creature as the same as the other encounters. It happened on May 12 or May of 2012 near Wrangler's Camp in LBL. She's only spoken to one other person. She had hiked a short distance up the hill when she unexpectedly came fairly close to this creature sitting and watching her. It let out the most blood-curdling snarl she had ever heard. She stated she was frozen in terror and began to pray. Finally, it stood up. She described the beast as massive, around seven feet tall, with large canine teeth. Finally, the beast left in one direction, and she ran as fast as she could in the other She's never been back since. It is obvious there's enough evidence to believe that there is something out there. Some of the stories of this creature date back to over 200 years. Some theorize that there is a family of them that inhabit hidden caves in the region. What is this creature of the land between the lakes? Is it actually a dogman or a shapeshifter as some have claimed? No one really knows. But it remains an unsettling case of what might or might not be something very strange and dangerous roaming about the wilderness of the LBL. For about 70 years, a tall bipedal wolf lake creature has been making regular appearances in rural Kentucky. This creature is known as Barilla. The name Barilla derives from a description given by the first witness to go public with his sighting in 1972. While being interviewed by the media, he stated the creature looked like a cross between a bear and a gorilla, thus being dubbed Barilla by the media. It is most often seen in the Gateway region of the state. The Gateway is an area located between the flatlands of the Bluegrass and the mountains of the Kentucky, eastern Kentucky. For this reason, it's also referred to as the Gateway Werewolf. Most witnesses describe it as being basically the same type of creature that's been spotted in the northern states, except the Barilla is always described as having white or silvery gray coat. It is close to the height of an average man, with arms and legs similar in proportion to a human. The hands or forepaws are said to have long, curving, sharp claws. The feet, judging by footprints, are said to be elongated and somewhat human-like but with shorter toes and a configuration more like a canine. The most striking feature, according to witness accounts, is an elongated snout with large protruding canine teeth and pointed incisors. This wolf-like creature also has a tendency to be much more aggressive. There has been several instances of aggressive behavior towards humans from this creature. Two involved actual attacks, both required treatment at local hospitals. The first attack 
and first report of this creature in Kentucky occurred in Johnson County in 1944. A teenage boy almost had to fight to the death with the creature over a string of fish. The boy reported he had been fishing along a small tree, a stream and had a considerable number of fish on his stringer. He stated as he was preparing to leave, a wolf-like creature ran up from the creek bank and attempted to take his fish. It was described as having silvery gray hair and standing about six feet tall. The boy attempted to keep the fish, but he was soon overpowered and the creature made off with his catch. The boy stated that the creature walked off and actually turned and smiled at him. The boy was treated at the local hospital for lacerations and shock. The story was never made public, but information of the incident was leaked out by one of the attending medical per personnel on duty at the time. The second attack happened in 72 along Hinkston Creek in Bourbon County. Here an early morning squirrel hunter was attacked and suffered deep lacerations across the back and legs. The unfortunate hunter stated he was attacked from the rear and pushed down on the ground. The hunter did not get a good look at the creature. He only saw its hands and a few brief flashes of the rest of its body. He described it as white or silvery with hands that were basically like humans, only much longer fingernails and they were covered with white hair. The creature then proceeded to basically bounce him up and down. The hunter credits his escape from a possible real death by playing dead. The horrified victim could not think of any possible way he could have provoked this attack. He states, it just came out of nowhere and jumped me. This dog man like creature also seems to have the un uncanny ability to escape pursuers after the attack from the hunter. A local group of men formed an old fashioned posse and went in search of this creature. Around dusk, the group, with the assistance of hunting dogs, seemed to have cornered the creature in an old barn. When the men and dogs attempted to enter the barn, the dogs cowered and whimpered in fear. The posse then decided to surround the barn and wait for daylight. The next morning, the dogs rushed in without showing any fear. To everyone's surprise, the barn was empty. Whatever frightened the dogs that night before was now gone. None of the hunters reported seeing anything leave the barn. The only signs anything had been in the barn were what appeared to be claw marks on the wall of the barn. It appears the creature had climbed to the top of the barn and simply vanished. Some of the last known sightings in the Gateway area occurred in 99 near Moorhead, Kentucky. A couple observed two of these creatures standing in a clearing near Highway 60. When they attempted to photograph the unusual duo, the creatures bared their fangs and emitted low growls. Needless to say, the couple fled the area immediately. These creatures also seem to inhabit areas around Ashland, Kentucky. Like their northern counterparts, these entities seem to enjoy hanging out in cemeteries. In the 80s, the Ashland Cemetery was a hot spot for sightings of dogman-like creatures. It was often seen running between headstones and jumping the wall of the surrounding cemetery. The witnesses all commented that the creature had incredible leaping power. It was said to have taken great joy in chasing humans and at one point cornered two lawmen sent to investigate a sighting. The startled lawman stated the creature came within 30 feet of them and paced back and forth between the gravestones growling. The creature eventually got bored with harassing the officers and wandered back into the cemetery. The remarkable leaping power of this beast was once again demonstrated on a lonely Greenup County back road in 2001. A couple driving separate cars encountered this creature running down the middle of the road toward them. Instead of going around both cars, it simply leapt over both of the cars and continued its journey down the middle of the road. The last Barilla sighting occurred in eastern Kentucky in 2005. A homeowner turned on his porch light to investigate a strange noise. He was startled to observe what he first thought was a child. But after getting a better look, he decided this was no child, at least not a human one. He described it as being three feet tall, covered with hair, and having a dog-like face. Whatever it was made a hasty retreat when it realized that it had been discovered. 
So there's some interesting encounters and attacks. Now, interestingly enough, when you look up the brutal murder that happened in Knott County uh, by the child Godsey, um, Barilla comes up, Google it, and Barilla will come up, or Google Barilla, and that incident will come up in Knott County. That's kind of weird. Here's another couple weird things. Now, as we, as we all know, um, hunting deer is, I mean, not only beneficial for the hunters who can pack their freezer, but it is good for the environment. Otherwise, the deer will overpopulate the area and become sick and just pretty much become a burden on the environment and the area that it's at. That's why hunting is legal and uh, not looked down upon. But, you know, there's still rules and regulations to follow. Well, not with the dog man, because deer are declining at land between the lakes. Officials at LBL, National Recreation Area, say hunters should expect more restrictive deer hunting regulations on the 170,000 acre federal property for 2016 season. Kentucky's archery deer hunters can expect more restrictive regulations for LBL area of 2016-17 season. The reason deer numbers are dwindling on the 40 mile long, 10 mile wide, heavily timbered peninsula that separates Lake Barclay and Kentucky Lake and includes parts of Lyon and Trigg County in Kentucky and Stewart County in Tennessee, according to LBL Wildlife Program Manager Steve Bloomer. We have seen a decline in deer numbers, said Bloomer, especially on the Kentucky side. A major change for Kentucky hunters will be the elimination of bonus deer, with the exception of the LBL Youth Quota Hunt. All deer taken off the LBL in 2016 will count toward the regular season's bag limit. Currently, LBL deer are bonus deer and do not count toward the statewide bag. Which means you, let's say you're given three tags to hunt with, and you go to LBL after your three tags are done, you can hunt and bring back deer. Um, because the population was so high at one point. And now it's dwindling. But here's the reasons why they say, air quotes, it's dwindling. Neither Kentucky State Wildlife nor federal LBL game officials could provide an estimate of the LBL deer herd, but both Bloomer and Gabe Jenkins, deer program coordinator for Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources, are convinced that the LBL numbers are in decline. They've seen a pretty significant population decline, noted Jenkins, and are concerned. Suspected and known reasons for the decline are varied, according to Bloomer, but they likely include increased hunting pressure, especially from bow hunters, and lingering effects from a severe outbreak of EHD in 2007, which killed an unknown amount of deer and led to the elimination of one adult quota deer hunt in 2009. Blomer said coyote predation is also taking an unknown amount of deer in LBL. The changing habitat is also a major factor. Blomer and Jenkins agree that the absence of open land at the LBL is detrimental to deer numbers. Approximately 94% of the property is heavily forested. LBL has traditionally been rich with whitetails, and one thing that has shifted in the half century since the property came under federal control is the expansion of forest canopy. In the mid-60s, the property had at least 18% of open land. Today, it's fewer than seven. Deer and turkey benefit from the mix of forest and open land habitat. 
At LBL, we manage for a variety of species and objectives, Blomer noted. If we manage just for deer, the deer would certainly benefit from more open land and more open management. Jenkins states that the state game agency will conduct a deer health survey on LBL in August. Results should be available by late this year or early 2017. Mass produced by areas vast hardwood forest does provide an excellent whitetail food source, but that is only available for a few months and the availability of acorns and other nuts vary from season to season. A mixture of open land and forest which provides sunlight and fresh forest floor growth is optimal deer cover and habitation. The 7% of LBL property that is open land includes co-opted farm plots along with power lines and road right-of-ways. Less than 4% of the forest is actively managed. So pretty much what they're saying is that now bow hunting and regular hunting is taking out the population of deer, also coyotes, and so on. Um, which I call BS because there's a reason why we hunt deer and I explained it earlier. Um, if they get sick, they breed, they just, you know, it has to happen. And a lot of people don't like it, and but it does, it, it really does have to happen. Um, at some point, there were so many deer that it didn't even count on your tag if you hunted at the LVL. So, I mean, that, that makes no sense. What, because there's a couple thousand more bow hunters, we're going to just completely eradicate a population of white-tailed deer in Kentucky? BS. Next is the coyotes taking and killing deer. You know, I'm going to get heat in the comment section from a couple people. My dad's property has coyotes, and I've seen them take down deer lots of times. Well, good for you. But it's not that often that it happens. You know, sure it happens, but you know, the chance of me walking down the sidewalk and smelling a fart in the wind happens too. But you know, it's not going to lead to the mass eradication of white-tailed deer in the LBL. And then the forest growth. Well, forest growing is great. Open land is great for for the deer to graze and stuff like that, but there's still a lot of food in that forest. So BS on you too. Um, it's <laughs> just another reason, you know, right there. The reason why all of this is covered up is because of tourist money. And that's the simple deal right there, tourist money. Like I said before, I live in a tourist town. Lake George, New York, the Adirondacks. We depend on tourist money every friggin' year. When it doesn't happen like COVID last year, we there was businesses that just went boom and were there for 40 years that were strictly mom and pop, gone now. You know, it's tourists and tourist towns rely on the tourists. So if we had a huge population of dogmen, or violent Bigfoot in the Adirondacks, you bet your bottom dollar that the government, the New York State government, would be hiding the fact that that shit was happening. Here's some other crazy stuff, guys. The countless number of deaths in LBL. Now, you look up LBL, or Land Between the Lakes, and put deaths or murders, and there's a shit ton, and missing. Check these out. This one, the first one I'm going to read to you, is the only article I could find on this guy. A Suwannee, Kentucky man was found dead following the search of the LVL. Robert Perrier, 46, was found dead Sunday morning by police dogs under the direction of Kentucky State Police Trooper Mike Turnbow and Beth Inman a canine investigator with McCracken County Coroner's Office. He was pronounced dead at the scene by Lyon County Coroner Ronnie Patton. Kentucky State Police, U.S. Forest Service, and Lyon County Rescue Squad members found Perrier's pickup truck 
in the area during the search that extended into the evening hours of Saturday, but did not find or locate Purrier. According to the news release from the Kentucky State Police Post, in Mayfield, the search for Purrier began after family members contacted police October 14th. Purrier did not report to work and had not been seen by friends and family since the 11th. Kentucky State Police spokesperson said morning that additional information concerning the investigation into the cause of death will not be available. <laughs> this happened in 2005, August 24th, this article came out. Um, no, nothing talked about an autopsy being released, no other additional information being released. Why? Why, you ask? It's a simple fact, cover it up. Tourist money comes in. The, the area succeeds. I mean, we're, we're talking major tourist area. A beautiful area. And then this crazy one. Two bodies found at the lake. Autopsies are being performed today at the Regional Medical Center in Madisonville on two bodies found floating in Lake Barclay early Wednesday at Devil's Elbow Recreational Area at the LBL. News release from Kentucky State Police said one of the bodies was an unidentified male, while the other was an unidentified female. Trooper Barry Meadows said the condition of the bodies indicated that they had been in the lake for a while. Meadows said one of the bodies was discovered by boaters in a small Devil's Elbow Bay, while the other body was located floating in nearby channel of Lake Barclay. No signs of foul play. Meadows added there were no abandoned boats in the area. Trigg County Sheriff Department was dispatched to the scene at 7.05, according to Sheriff Randy Clark who said no one had been reported missing in Trigg County. Meadows also said state police had not received reports of missing people in the surrounding area. State police also are investigating an abandoned sports utility vehicle, which had been found recently in Devil's Elbow area. State police detective traveled to Springfield, Tennessee Wednesday afternoon to examine the vehicle that was towed from the Devil's Elbow recreational area last week. State police are investigating the case. The Kadzid Police Department, Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Forestry Service, and Trigg County Coroner's Office are assisting in the investigation. Where does that sound familiar? You know, when you have a mob of people assisting, well, Lippin, Texas, Florida, and what happens there? Cover up. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. Your support is honestly what makes the channel continue to grow and go and what makes it special. Guys, with that being said, stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, our family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there. They are dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time. Never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.